Hello. Welcome everyone to this IOP lecture, which is actually the second one that we are hosting here at the University of Wolverhampton. Campus. So thank you very much for, for coming. Um, today um, I'm presenting uh, David Cross, um, who, um, well, he's passionate about fast cars. Right? <laughs> he's been following the, the automotive sports since, as himself put it, he can remember. Um, and so when he was 17, he started racing. And when he was 18, he had to choose either following automotive sports or science. And I guess you can deduce what he chose, right? Um, and so he did um, electronics, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That led to an IT career. Seduced by software. Seduced by software, okay. Um, he got himself uh, his own company. That way he got the sponsorship to become a uh, proper racer. Although he has been racing like his entire life, always at an amateur level, but still, that's, that's very impressive. And it's very different to compete in, 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 in racing than to try fast. Right? Absolutely. Um, so today he's going to speak about friction, stiction, and air force constriction. I hope I have pronounced all of them correctly. Um, and with that, uh, I will give you the floor uh, to speak. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, good evening. Thank you for having me. Yeah, as I said, I'm, the one thing you need to know is actually that I'm uniquely qualified. Not for anything, but uniquely. <laughs> because I'm a lapsed physicist. I qualified, but then I never practiced. As I said, I got seduced by software. I'm also a retired engineer, although there are a lot of people who don't consider software to be an engineering discipline. I'm arguably, no. I'm also an ex-racing <coughs> driver. And again, there are a number of my racing colleagues who would question that on occasion. <laughs> but uh, here I am. What I am is still, I am a committee member of the Institute of Physics, uh, which is how I get to do penance like this. We write enough Peggy letters to other people, so occasionally we have to show up and do it ourselves. Um, I'm also still the competition secretary of my local motor club, but I'm an active competitor. As, as uh, you heard, I'm, I've been uh, competing since I was 17, and I'm still doing it. I took the championship when I was last year in my club, so I'm still reasonably competitive. Uh, and what I am also is an inveterate, lifelong, and completely unrepentant petrol head. So, <coughs> Formula One is my... Broke it already. There we go. So, Formula One is, is my sort of soap opera that I follow. And the physics of it has always intrigued me. So, I want to tell you what, uh, how they go about doing things. And you must bear in mind that I'm a strict Newtonian. The physics I learned in school is what I'm talking about, and uh, yeah, some of it needs to be revised. So, getting off for 18 months ago now, when this talk first germinated, I was watching this guy taking his fifth British Grand Prix win. Massive achievement, absolutely massive. But if you'd watched the television or you read the newspapers, you'd have thought he was the first guy who'd ever won the British Grand Prix. You'd have thought he was the first racing driver from Britain who'd ever been um, competing or ever been successful. And I know he wasn't, because I remember this guy, Sterling Moss. This is who I grew up with. As soon as I could sort of form the words racing driver, Sterling Moss uh, was the man of the moment. And he was the first British racing driver to win a British Grand Prix which was in 1955 at Aintree. And I've driven part of the track. Um, unfortunately, it's not a proper racing circuit anymore. It's, it follows the infield of the horse racing track, and half of it's been uh, cut off and built over. But I've driven around part of the course that he did. Uh, of course, I didn't see that on television, because that was 55. And in my life story, television didn't get invented until 1962 just in time for Jim Clark, but that's another story. And if I start this digressing now, we'll be here all night. Sterling Moss wasn't the first British driver to win a Grand Prix. Dick Seaman won the German Grand Prix in, what was it, 38? 38 when he won it, he was driving from 37. But the, uh, the common thread is 
both Sterling Moss and Dick Seaman and Lewis Hamilton were all driving Mercedes Grand Prix cars. And those Mercedes Grand Prix cars were state-of-the-art and all conquering. The newspapers didn't make so much of Dick Seaman in 1938 for fairly obvious reasons. In fact, the other little swastikas painted on the cars probably didn't help very much. <coughs> um, actually, that's unfair uh, to his memory because he was actually anti-Nazi and uh, had a rough time in the team. But never mind. I say we got off on, uh, on tangents. And while we're off on tangents, this the 1934 car that looked very similar to this one is the first one to have been called the Silver Arrow. And the reason why it was called the Silver Arrow illustrates one of the common themes in Grand Prix racing. And that is the power struggle between the teams and the designers and the engineers and the administrators and the organisers. The administrators and the organisers, the men in blazers in Paris, were convinced that they had to slow down the current level of Grand Prix cars. Well, we heard this story before. That was in the early 30s. But because it was in the early 30s, they didn't fully understand what the teams were capable of doing. So they came up with a wonderful idea. They noticed that all the fastest cars of the era were the biggest and the heaviest. So they said, what we'll do is we'll have a new formula that has a maximum, sorry, maximum, minimum, weight limit of 750 kilograms. You may not build a car heavier than 750 kilograms. Mercedes engineers went off and saw, yeah, okay, we can still build a V12 3 litre supercharged race car with all the technology we can cram into it. And we sure can get that up to 750 kilograms. Well, they couldn't. It was 751 and a bit. And it was painted in the German national racing colour of white, as all German racing cars were at the time. So they simply stripped the paint off and returned it to its bare aluminium. And that got it under the 750 kilograms. And that's why it's called the Silver Arrow. And they've been silver ever since. One in the eye for the men in blazers. Anyway, at this point I was learning to read. And I was learning to read about Grand Prix cars um, and motor racing. And this is how I started the, uh, the research project, the culmination of which you're hearing tonight. So I learned all about it. I started um, doing some practical experiments as well, as you do. And eventually, at the age of 58, I got my race license. Now, they don't just hand these out, you have to work for these. Uh, as I was explaining earlier on, that, that it involves a full day at Silverstone with an, uh, an instructor sitting next to you, making sure that you can A, pedal quickly enough not to be an embarrassment to everybody else, and B, safely enough to preserve everybody else. So finally, I did it, and I spent three years campaigning all the circuits in the UK uh, in a Toyota Supra sports car, at uh, Supra, Toyota MR2 sports car. Um, I must, he's not here tonight, but if he were here I would give a great uh, vote of thanks to my friend John Wilson who I shared this car with um, and a great commiseration to his wife um, because he got sucked in rather deeper than I did and he's still doing it 10 years ago. Um, I ran out of money and eyesight at the same time. So I, I know I'm good. But I have got one circuit left in the UK that I haven't driven around. And that's Lynn Hill down in Kent. So sometime in, uh, uh, when, sometime in July, I think, we're, we're heading off to Kent so I can do that one. And I will then have driven around every racetrack in the UK uh, within a 10-year period. And I've also got two under my belt in uh, New Zealand and Australia, and I'm heading some more over there. So. Absolutely. So what got me thinking was this 50-year period of my lifetime and, and this Grand Prix development and the kind of changes that have happened and how Formula One cars have developed. And you see here the, the sort of uh, numbers, the raw numbers. They are both dramatically fast cars. Uh, either car 
would be simply to have a ride in either car would shatter your um, perceptions of what's possible. But the thing is that Dick Seaman, if he came back from his 1938 Grand Prix Triumph and jumped into Sterling Moss's 1955 car, he would be perfectly at home. He could go out and he could cane that car around the track just as hard as he did his 1938 car. If Sterling Moss, well Sterling Moss wouldn't physically be capable of getting into Lewis Hamilton's car, because they're now built for midgets. Current Grand Prix drivers are, are yay big. They, they, don't, you know, they don't have large people in. And it would then take a team of 12 engineers and a couple of laptops to get the thing started. Even if he got it started, he'd be completely lost when he got out on the track, because he's got so many controls on the steering wheel. Uh, and its capability is so much higher than the 1955 car, he wouldn't know where to begin. The reason, sorry, I was just going to say, that clearly the current car is dramatically faster than the 55 or the 38, but it is nowhere near as fast as it could be because of this ongoing battle with the many blazers. Formula One cars are not the fastest cars we can build. They are simply the best compromise we can achieve within the current rules. Uh, and that's why we have this hybrid formula, that's why we have the wings to certain dimensions, that's why the tyres are constrained. The goalposts have been moving all the time. And that gives us a huge problem when we try to, to compare different eras. They're, they're not really comparable. I'll come on to that in a minute. But just as, as a side note, that's something I need to mention. This Formula One engine in the back of uh, Lewis Hamilton's Mercedes is an absolute world record holder in one single respect, and that is in its thermal efficiency. The maximum thermal efficiency you can get out of a petrol engine is apparently about 64%. I've never done the maths myself, so I'm taking that for granted. But that Mercedes engine achieves over 50%. Currently, the best, up to that point, uh, the best examples were marine diesels and certain power stations. And they only ever managed to between 30 and 40, 33 and 40%. So 50% out of that McLaren, that Mercedes, is remarkable. So, how can we compare these different eras? Well, average speed isn't going to work because the tracks are different, the aerodynamics are different. Power to weight ratio, again, the rules have changed, you can't do that. The maximum g-force the car can produce, well, that's obviously dramatically different because the tyres are different. Pomeroy Index is an interesting one. Uh, Lawrence Pomeroy was a, an engineering journalist and, and he invented a method of comparing the performance of different cars. What he did was he took the 1908 Renault that won the first ever Grand Prix in, in France in uh, obviously 1908. Um, he gave that a, an index of 100%. And he found a car that raced against it and beat it and he compared the lap times on whatever circuit they competed on uh, and worked out the new index for the, for the next car. And then, using that process, he went all the way through to about 1966. So the, I think the BRM uh, P201 of 1966 had a Pomeroy index of 220 or thereabouts, meaning it was 220% faster than that 1908 Renault. But various things have happened since then, which means it's very difficult to continue that index going forward. Principally, the fact that all the circuits have changed. And so what you compare uh, one year to the next is not the same uh, lap time. The Nürburgring is about the only circuit that is still the same as it used to be in the 30s. Although it's been resurfaced a number of times and some of the corners have been changed. However, the Nürburgring is still used by all the major car manufacturers as a kind of um, badge of honour to see what time they can get down there. And that leads me on to this lady, who is a taxi driver around the Nürburgring, um, Sabine Schmidt. Schmitz, sorry. Um, and when I say a taxi driver, they, there is a taxi service around the Nürburgring. You can turn up, pay this lady some money for one of her friends, and she will take you on a hot lap around this 13 mile race circuit, and it is 
is. I can't imagine. Anyway, the time she can get round there in that Porsche is 7 minutes 12 seconds. So that means a taxi driver in a mildly modified Volkswagen Beetle <laughs> can get round the Nürburgring in a time that it go back to 1976 when James Hunt and Nicky Lauda were going head to head. 7 minutes 12 would have put them mid-grid road car mid-grid of 1976 Formula 1 car. That's a measure of, of progress. But still, it's not what we were trying to get to. So, this is one out of my own recollection. In 1967, I stood by the track in Alton Park and I watched Jack Brabham win this race, the Alton Park Gold Cup, highlight of the Alton Park year. It was a Formula 1 race then, at that time. Formula 1 drivers would enter non-championship races, um, probably five or six a year, in addition to the Grand Prix. They only had six or seven Grand Prix during the year, so six or seven other races uh, filled their time in quite, quite a lot. But they'd also do other cars, sports car races and saloon car races. Jim Clark came up to this race in 67 and ran a Lotus Cortina in the saloon car race. So, anyway, I watched Jack Brown do that. And I remember that he said the new fastest lap, one minute, 30 seconds. I've driven, I've raced around Alton Park, and if I can get under two minutes, I think I'm doing quite well, but in the, in the Toyota, one minute 30 is quite quick. And he was driving a state-of-the-art car. 21 years later, his son, Gary, comes along to do the same race. And again, I was there, standing over the track. Um, by now, times have moved on. Grand Prix drivers don't compete in non-Grand Prix races. And the Alton Park Cold Cup has been downgraded to Formula 3 status. Formula 3 is the up-and-coming races first training grounds. It's the first serious open-wheel racing. You've got Formula 4 and things like that, but Formula 3 is the first one where you've got wings, slick tyres, proper racing. The engines in them are out of road cars, they're nothing that special, but the cars themselves are really quite tricky. They're all very much the same, and talent counts. Gary Brown wasn't, wasn't half bad. He won the race in 88. Again, as I recall, he lowered the Formula 3 lap record to 1 minute 30 seconds, or thereabouts. So he did exactly the same speed round the circuit as his dad had done 21 years earlier but in a vastly different car. His dad was driving state-of-the-art Formula 1, he's driving off the peg Formula 3. Who's faster there? I don't know. Anyway, while we're on this subject, I'll tell you another little story about Jack Brabham. And it's an interesting story because it's the only story I know that I heard verbatim from the only Grand Prix driver that I've ever met, personally. And that was a guy called Chris Lawrence who at the time was the uh, sort of chief designer and mentor of Morgan's in, uh, in Malden. And he was largely responsible for the new breed of Morgan's, the aluminium body ones, um, the more modern ones, with BMW engines. Back in uh, early 66, the formula changed. Up to 66, it had been one and a half litre pure racing engines. From 66 onwards, we went to three litres, and there weren't any engines. Nobody had a three litre racing engine that would sit in the back of a Formula One car. BRM bought out their one and a half litre engine at two litres, while they started working on new ones. Ferrari were off the mark, they got a three litre V12 racing engine, they were okay. Jack Brabham cobbled together an engine out of a four and a half litre Sorry, the Conrad's out of a four and a half litre Daimler engine, the pistons from some Ford, and a Repco Oldsmobile uh, th um, four litre V8 that was, um, had a new crank put in it to bring it down to three litres. Um, massive engineering job and very creditable engine as well. So, he was, so there were a handful of cars that were going well. Chris Lawrence thought. I know where there's an old Ferrari V12 sports car engine I can get my hands on. And I'm sure I can buy an old Cooper chassis from, uh, from this guy I know. So he did. Screwed it together. 
managed to get himself into a couple of Formula One races. About the third one he did was the Nurburgring. So he gets himself out there in the back of the truck, practices on the Friday night before the race on the Sunday, and strips a crown wheel and pinning. All right. Broke. Uh, phone's home from a phone box down the road, of course, 67. No uh, manages to get somebody to get the new crown wheel and pinion, put it on uh, a commercial flight, get it dropped off at the nearest airport, taxi arrives. So the taxi arrives in the paddock on the Saturday at about 7 or 8 o'clock at night. Crown wheel and pinion. Races at um, 2 o'clock the following day. Starts assembling the, uh, pulling the gearbox apart, reassembling it. It won't fit. The crown wheel, the, uh, crown wheel is 60 thou too wide. Needs to be machined down. So he's wandering all around the paddock trying to find somebody to say, where is there an engineering shop that I can wake up and get this thing machined this time of night? Nobody to be seen anywhere. Until he goes to the back of the rubber truck knocks on the door and finds Jack Brabham inside the truck, 8 o'clock on the Saturday night before the Grand Prix. He's already the world champion, incidentally, from the previous year, fettling his own car. Just tinkering, happy. Chris says to, to Jack, I need this machining. I don't know where I can go. Do you know anybody around? Jack looks at it and says, come here, boy. Australian, can't be Australian. <laughs> Belly locker underneath the truck, slides out a tray, lathe. Leave it with me, he says. About half an hour. Half an hour later, wanders across to Chris in the paddock. There you go. Get it fit. Chris was in that race the following day. Can you imagine that sort of thing happening now? <laughs> no. Anyway. What I decided to do, before I continually digress and we're here for all night, is to tell you three little stories, because the whole business of Grand Prix racing is <coughs> so complex, so convoluted, and so dominated by aerodynamics, that I can't possibly do it justice. And because, because primarily I know very little about aerodynamics, I'm not going to touch that at all. So I'm going to talk about three little snapshots of development. Uh, that have been a fairly constant theme through the years and that illustrate the way Formula One engineers go about things and the kind of levels that they can stoop to or uh, encourage themselves to. And uh, what I want you to keep at the back of your mind is that for each one of these, every other aspect of the car has been researched and developed in at least the same level of detail, possibly more. So we're going to talk about combating friction, we're going to talk about sticking the car on the road, and we're going to talk about the engine air intake and the way it constricts airflow. And perversely, I'm going to start at the end, uh, and how to overcome this constriction. Now I promised you some physics, so here you go. Here's a formula. This is Ferrari's formula. This is how they characterize the, uh, a new design. The interesting thing from our point of view, and I may have to uh, use my crib sheet to make sure I point the right thing. So rho there is air density. Z is the number of cylinders. Uh, that's fixed by regulation. Now, S is the surface area of the pistons, total surface area of all the pistons. Again. The capacity of the engine is fixed, the uh, number of cylinders is fixed. That does give you a little bit of freedom in choosing the, the uh, bore ratio and therefore the, the piston area, but not a lot. And I think there are actually limits on it as well. Uh, VP is the, uh, what is it, the piston, uh, mean piston speed, that's right. Again, the regulation is now specified maximum RPM that you're not allowed to exceed. So, given that the stroke and the bore ratio have you know, got to be decided, uh, if the stroke is fixed, then the mean piston speed is actually going to come out of that as well. So that's not a lot of uh, option for changing that. 
you can't alter the number 4. So what you're left with on in that first set of brackets, sorry, uh, what you're left with in that first set of brackets there is that little eta volume, which is the volumetric efficiency. It's just an indicator of how well, how efficiently the damage operates. On the other side of the thing, well, that's, that's chemistry. I don't understand anything about that. That's, 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 uh, <laughs> stoichiometric ratios and uh, uh, calorific value of the fuel and all that kind of stuff. Again, the regulations now stipulate exactly the kind of fuel mix you're allowed. You can't bung methanol in it like um, uh, Sterling Moss and uh, Dick Seaman used to do. You now have to be pump fuel. Not only does it have to be pump fuel, you have to deposit with the FIA a sample of the fuel you're going to use at the beginning of the season and they will do a, uh, use a mass spectrometer to make sure that the fuel you're using at the race is exactly the same as the sample you delivered at the start of the season. So there's very little option for cheating there. And this little thing at the end is another item, that's another uh, efficiency um, indice, index, that's the uh, thermal efficiency. So we've got the volumetric and we've got the thermal efficiency and they both multiplied by a number of constants give us the power output. So the only thing the engineers have actually got control over are the two efficiencies. Which is why we're going to talk about um, engineering techs. And this is just to prove that I did some serious research. And I'm just make this up as I go along. And I want to talk as an example about this engine because this is my, one of my favourite engines. This is the V10 that was in the back of Michael Schumacher's car when he won the championship in 2000. And he ended a 21 year drought that Ferrari had endured up to that point. It's an absolutely wonderful engine. It also happens to be the only one I've got any sensible drawings on. <laughs> <laughs> may or may not have anything to do with it. This is um, a picture of a test engine in Ferrari's lab. This is a single single test engine that they actually built to um, verify some of their design constraints. They don't do that anymore, they do it all on the computer. Or can't show anybody pictures of the computer. And what I want you to notice about this is the way that the bell mouth at the top of the intake uh, port is supported on these threaded rods at the side here. So by uh, turning those knurled threads, uh, nuts on the, on the side of that, you can make this whole assembly slide up and down these rods. And you can therefore adjust the length, the difference in, the, in height between the end of that bell mouth and the valve at the bottom of it. So you can physically alter the uh, length of the engineering tape. Uh, Bit like a slide trombone, and that's what's shown uh, diagrammatically there as a, an extract from that uh, diagram of the Ferrari engine. And what we know, what everybody knows about pipes, uh, particularly pipes with kind of bell ends like that, is they make noise. They like they are like trombones. They like trumpets. They resonate like pan pipes. And that's what happens with the air inside these things. So when the valve opens, the air rushes in, and there, thematically, is the, uh, is the air flooding in and into the engine. But then the valve shuts, and the air has mass, and therefore momentum, and it piles up behind the valve, because it's still hurtling down this tube. Consequently, down here, we get high pressure significantly higher pressure down here than in the rest of the inlet tract or even in the, in the atmosphere. What then happens is that that pressure causes a rebound. The air rushes back out and momentarily we get a high pressure region around the bell mouth. One thing follows another, the air rushes back again, we get more air piling up now, back at the back of the valve. The valve is still short, but we've got high pressure again here. And this rebounding mechanism, this resonance, happens several times. Clearly, 
the air has a, a mass, it has a given speed, the length of the pipe is a fixed level length, uh, it's going to take a certain amount of time for that to happen. Clearly, while that is happening as well, the rest of the engine is going about its normal business, it's rotating still, and eventually that valve will open again. Now then, if it happens by some miracle of engineering or uh, accident of computation, that there was a high pressure region just behind that valve when it opens, then more air and gas will flow into the engine than would otherwise have happened. If, on the other hand, at that, the point the valve opens, the mass of air was at the other end of the pipe, you get less air into the engine. So the quantity of fuel that's taken into the cylinder depends crucially on what point in that resonant flow the valve actually opens. That depends on the engine speed, it depends on the length of that track. So, we end up with this kind of situation. Here we have the engine speed in RPM, and very crudely we have a, a plus one to minus one alteration in cylinder filling. So at this particular speed, the length of the inlet port is such that the gas was up at the outer end impeding any more airflow, and at that point, the mass of the air was down behind the valve and flooded directly into the engine, meaning that we got an increase in what normally we could uh, fill. Why does that matter? Well, it matters because of this curve. This is the kind of curve you get from an engine. This is hypothetical. I've not, I've, Ferrari are very good, but they won't give you a lot of data on what their engines actually do, so this is a bit of guesswork. But engines are commonly like this. They don't have a nice linear power delivery. They have lumps in it. At this point, for some reason, the power delivery is quite high. It, it doesn't drop off. It still increases, but it increases at a much slower rate over this point, and then it shoots off up to its maximum value. Now, the one thing racing drivers do not like is inconsistency. When you are halfway around the corner, even if you're just in a, a lowly Toyota MR2 like me, uh, but certainly if you're Lewis Hamilton or, or Sebastian Vettel, when you are halfway around the corner and you've planted your foot on the pedal expecting it to go, you do not want that kind of extra little bump in the power curve. That leads to embarrassment. Embarrassment leads to barriers, barriers lead to uh, loss of points and loss of job eventually. So we want to get rid of that. If we combine that curve with the one we had before, and we match up the speeds properly, we can take the negative area of the inlet port resonance and use that to smooth out this region. And we can arrange for the positive reinforcement to increase the power ratio over this area. So we end up with a flatter, more benign power curve all the way through, and over the vast majority of the engine's range, <laughs> sorry, the vast majority of the engine's range and its output, in the area where the racing driver is going to want to be working, we've got an improvement over the standard engine. So clearly, that's what we want to do. But this is a simplified diagram. This is a simplified situation with just a single length inlet port, which just has a, uh, one resonant frequency, <coughs> we can't match that single resonant frequency with the whole engine range of resonance that we want to try and do. So it would be nice if we could alter that um, while, the, while the car is actually running. And back in 1955, Mercedes had exactly that idea. They used a single intake for the whole engine. It was a straight eight they were running at that point. And they put this kind of curved uh, inlet port on it. This is a patent uh, they actually developed for it. What, it's really difficult to see in this diagram. But essentially, there are two um, like, uh, like uh, shells um, with gas paths. And there's a rotating vane inside 
so that by changing the position of which, where the, the vein connects the two uh, paths, uh, you can alter the length that the gas will flow around. The reason they built this and used it in the lab but never put it on a, on a race car uh, was, I think, all to do with the control system. Back in this era, control systems were purely mechanical. You cannot get a mechanical control system to have the right <coughs> uh, reaction time, the lack of um, sensitivity, the lack of, the, the lack of precision that we now uh, associate with electro-hydraulic uh, and electro-pneumatic control systems. Mechanical controls just won't do it. To give you a flavour of um, that's water. But just to give you a, a flavour of the kind of thing that um, the Mercedes were playing with at this time as far as um, control systems were concerned, they built themselves a land speed record contender in 1955. And that, that had a problem with traction control. Traction control, as we know now, is, is purely an electronic function. Um, but they tried to do a mechanical system. So they used a differential gear, the same as you would use in the back axle of a car. Except this was running the other way around. It had two feeds coming into it, driven by speedo gears, speedo cables, one from the front wheels, one from the back wheel. So if the front wheels were going at a certain speed, but the back wheels were going a lot faster because the car had lost traction, the differential gear would have an output, and they used that output to back off the throttle. So automatically, the car would slow down, the wheels would gain traction. When the two wheels were running in synchrony, there was no output from it, and the full throttle could be maintained. So that's the kind of system that they were playing with. And they ditched it from a land speed record car because it wasn't adequate, and the same problem uh, hindered the, um, the variable inlet tract. But Ferrari in 2000 had electronic uh, hydro electro hydraulic control systems. So they could put a couple of rounds uh, where those threaded rods were on the single cylinder test engine, and they could drive this intake up and down dynamically and at the speed that required um, with a Formula One engine. Now, if we talk about the speed required, obviously, you know how fast cars go, but we're talking here about what we call slew rate. We're talking about the, the rate, the, t the speed that the car engine by itself can change speed. So it can go from, let's say, 10,000 to 15,000 at a rate of 25,000 RPM per second. So it'll take half a second to get from 10,000 to 25,000. Purely by itself, obviously, if it's driving the car, it can't achieve that. But that's the speed at which the engine can accelerate internally. So that's the sort of rate you have to move these, um, these inlet ports. And in fact, Ferrari would change the length of the input port five times in the rev range of the car. So the engine management system, the ECU, would be driving these things um, and con constantly tuning the inlet length to get the maximum output from the car. They were also getting ram effect because the airflow of the car at 200 miles an hour is, is pressurizing the inlet uh, chamber, the plenum chamber that's feeding these things. And again, just to give you a flavor of the kind of uh, control that they can exert now with the electronic ECUs, when the driver stands on the throttle coming out of a hairpin corner in this V10, he does not get full output from all 10 cylinders. What happens is that the ECU will hold back the fueling and the ignition on one bank of the five cylinders and give full throttle to only one bank. So the engine will actually only get half its power output until it's reached the proper or the, the, the RPM range that they've dialed in 
previously, according to the track, when the other bank of cylinders will chime in and you'll get, the driver will get full output. And this is all in the pursuit of removing those embarrassing sudden surges of power that cause drivers to go off into the boondocks. So that's the, the length that they're going to. Now, this is the first example of what I mean by cheating in inverted commas. Because with tricks like that, they actually get more than 100% efficiency. So that's what, that's what I mean by cheating. So, let's talk about friction. Um, friction is the word we use to describe nature's way of turning motion into heat. The Industrial Revolution and everything we've learned since then have been various ways of turning heat into motion. Well, nature's always fighting back and that's what we call friction. If you look at the output of, a, of an internal combustion engine, the actual output from it, the energy output, divides up into these different ways. And this is a lawnmower engine, it's not a Ferrari, but the principles so. So we've got the big red one up there is uncombusted fuel. Uh, we've got heat, heat lost in we got that fuel carries away some heat as well. Uh, the exhaust gases carry away a lot of heat. The coolant uh, the engine rejects heat into the coolant, that gets rejected out into the radiators, so an awful lot of coolant gets lost. That's a major problem on a, on a racing car, because that also causes a lot of drag. The bigger the radiator, the more drag you get, and the more it hooks up your aerodynamics. Mechanical losses, friction within the bearings, pistons against piston walls, and cylinder walls. That's the story that we're going to be talking about in a few minutes. And finally, you get a little bit of useful output. Now, obviously, in a Formula One engine, those numbers are all radically different, but the principles are the same. We're talking about thermal efficiency here. We're talking about how much energy we can get out of the fuel we put in. The reason that the Lewis Hamilton's Mercedes engine has got such good thermal efficiency is because it recovers a lot of that exhaust heat via a turbine. Back in 2000, that wasn't part of the regs, so I won't be talking about that. And I'll just be talking about the, uh, the friction. So the story about friction has been the desire to get the bearings and the internal rubbing services to, to work uh, more smoothly and generating less heat by using basically thinner oil, because the less oil you use in the engine, the less heat gets rejected out Actually, one that's not one on there. There is heat loss to coolant uh, there. The coolant is not just the water, the coolant is the oil as well. And in a Formula One engine, the oil probably carries away more heat than the, than the water does. So, if we can reduce that, we can improve the car dramatically. Until, of course, we reduce it too much and the whole lot goes bang. So, what do we know about friction? Well, Leonardo uh, da Vinci was probably the first man to actually write down some laws of friction uh, 200 years before Newton, so that's not a bad going. Uh, if he hadn't written them all backwards in mirror writing, we might have known more about them, but uh, he kept it all to himself. And what he said was, if the load of an object is doubled, then its friction will also be doubled. Friction depends primarily on load. And the areas in contact between the varying surfaces have no effect on the friction. That's counterintuitive. It trips up an awful lot of schoolboys, but it's universally been shown to be true. Amontong, um, French bloke I don't know a great deal about, he actually uh, was the first one who was recognised um, and codified these laws a bit more rigorously uh, and therefore became the standard work. And then Coulomb extended it by noting that there's a non-linear effect when you talk about sliding friction, when the two surfaces, when one of the two surfaces is moving relative to the other, and that the frictional force is, does not uh, alter in a linear way. But it wasn't until the 50s 
that Bowden and Tabor actually gave us a proper explanation of what was going on. And they did it by looking at the contact surfaces. What they found were two things, and they explained the two laws in, the, in this way. First of all, if you apply more pressure, then you deform the points at which the surfaces meet. Generally speaking, whatever the surface, no matter how finely machined it is, it will have this kind of roughness, and it will touch at various peaks. If we put heavier loads on it, those peaks will deform, and the areas will increase. And so that's what happens, uh, that's why friction in increases uh, with load. Eventually, you can actually get uh, cold welding happening if, there's, if the load is too high. What also happens is that if you look at that surface, it has a fractal nature. So if you look at it on different scales, then you will see different points. And this is why the frictional force does not depend on contact area in the, in the way you might imagine. If you take twice the length of uh, the scale that you're using, then you'll simply find higher peaks over that point, over that range. And every time you look at it, you get essentially the same fractal image. You get the same characteristic number of peaks hitting each other, and therefore pretty much the same actual contact area, despite the fact that the perceived contact area has been doubled. And that's why friction tends to be independent of contact area. So at least uh, when Bowden and Taylor uh, wrote that up, we had a, an understanding then of, of the historic laws, and everyone uh, felt fairly happy about it. But then when you start looking at lubricated uh, surfaces, you get into a whole other slew of problems. There are thin film boundary conditions where the, the layers of lubricant actually get absorbed into the surface and then they, they alter the, uh, the uh, chemical composition of the surfaces and change the conditions that way. In the hydrodynamic region, you get churning of the lubricant, you get the surfaces being held apart, you get uh, viscous shear absorbing energy, you get all sorts of things going on there. And in that boundary layer between the two, um, it just gets more complex than I care to think of that. So, we even have a situation now where we can have chemical etching going on between the, um, uh, the lubricant and the, um, and the surface. So, the, the chemical, the, there are some additives in the oils these days that actually smooth out the asperities in the bearing surfaces chemically. And so, we have a range of engine regimes that we need different lubrication facilities for. If we have high viscosity lubricants, which could withstand high pressures, um, that allows a greater volume to be moved through. But if, sorry, that has a certain volume to be moved through. But if we lower the viscosity, and therefore we make the oil easier to pump, we can shift a lot more oil through the engine, we can carry more heat away, we can keep the surfaces cooler, and we can reduce friction that way. Friction modifiers, that we put in, as I said earlier on, uh, actually chemically etch away the, the asperities. Footnote here about the uh, about Shell's work with McLaren in 1988. Again, just to give you a scale of the, of the kind of improvements that can be, have, can be uh, achieved. 1988 McLaren used up three kilowatts of engine power at 12,000 RPM in order to drive the oil system simply to pump the oil around the engine, three kilowatts. Putting the oil, the, the Shell's new additives in there, took out 1.4 kilowatts of that and made the car 0.8 seconds uh, faster on a lap. That, at the end of a race, meant half a lap faster than it would have been earlier on. That's the difference between first and fifth, generally speaking. So, we need, uh, look, the, the whole, Direction of, of the direction of flow, the direction of work in lubrication has been continuing to reduce the viscosity of the, of the oil to the point where the engine will 
coat uh, will go bang and then back off slightly so that it still stays intact. And where we used it in the 50s, uh, castor oil was the base for oils. It's now predominantly synthetic um, lubricants. And castor oil had this one benefit uh, in, in the uh, vintage era that it resists being diluted by petrol. The engines at the old engines were very loose. They had large gaps and piston bores and valve clearances, and petrol was constantly getting through the, the uh, combustion process down past the rings into the sump, diluting the oil and reducing its effectiveness. Castor oil resisted that magnificently, and that's why it was used. That's why any old uh, guy like me can go to a, a, a motorcycle race and smell castor oil or vintage cars and uh, it just gets, us, gets our juices flowing. But that was then, so resistance to dilution by petrol uh, was a key benefit. What's happening in the current era is exactly the inverse of that. And this is the next um, episode of cheating, in a way. The viscosity of the oils is now so thin, they get heavily aerated. You've got to get the air out because you can't pump air. You can only pump oil. So if you want to get good flow around your bearings, you've got to get the air out of the oil first. So Formula 1 engines run little centrifuges. So as the engine is... Because if you think of the scavenge pumps in the, uh, in the sump of the engine, uh, the scavenging pumps are drawing your used oil back out of the engine to put it back into the high-pressure region so it can go around again. Those scavenge pumps must have a higher capacity than the capacity of oil, than the quantity of oil that's coming through them. Otherwise they, they choke. So they are constantly dragging air in. So you have to get that out. In the old days it was sufficient to simply put it into a spiral pipe into a swirl pot um, and just allow it time to percolate its way through and the air would naturally bubble out. Can't afford time and inform the wall. So it goes into a high powered centrifuge and the oil is literally flung around the outside of the pump, drained off, and the air escapes up the middle. So there's some quite complex pipe work leading back to the catch tanks. One bright idea that one engineer dreamed of was, well, we're going to feed this aerated oil uh, contaminated air back into the engine through the plane chamber. Suppose that oil had in it some combustible elements. We would then have an extra fueling route because we're now pumping a bit of oil. Now suppose our engine used up more oil than it used to. Well, we could easily organise that, couldn't we? And suppose we put some additives in the oil that help combustion. I told you earlier on that the fuel they use is rigidly controlled by the FIA. A few years ago, the FIA weren't controlling the oil. So the oil got more and more contaminated with esters and olefins and, and all sorts of other highly uh, volatile substances. And cars started to dramatically use up an awful lot of oil every lap because it was all being pumped up into the engineering tape and feeding back into the engine and getting remarkably more power out of it. Yeah, that's been tapped on the head now, but that's the level of ingenuity, if you like, that uh, Formula 1 engineers employ. So, right, enough about friction. Well, not quite. Here's one of my favourite looking cars. Didn't go very well. In fact, it was a bit of a turkey, but... Uh, this is Jensen Button in his uh, 2007 Honda. Ah. It's an appropriate standard, I think, to use for comparison purposes, which I'm going to get onto in a minute, because it's not a particularly good Formula 1 car. It's just a fairly average one. Um, we're going to compare that with an apple, because we know a lot about apples. Well, Newton taught us quite a number of things, and specifically how fast they can accelerate. Uh, we know that if they fall off a tree, um, then in four seconds, they can hit 87 miles an hour. That's if you can find a tall enough tree. Um, 
and a couple of nanoseconds later they hit 88 and disappear in a flash of blue smoke. Back to the future. You that. So that's, that's what we know about apples. Jensen's button hung can get to 100 miles an hour in four seconds. And that's a fairly average current breaker. Now, in my day at school, that would immediately have people sitting up and taking notice. Uh, but just as a yardstick, uh, my mother-in-law's course I can barely get to 30 miles an hour in four seconds. <laughs> uh, that's how this is So, what do we know about um, friction? Let's just revise what we, we talked about earlier. As I say, in my day, the coefficient of friction was known to be a maximum of one. So you couldn't accelerate anything faster than g um, by, by frictional contact. Simply not possible. But rubber tyres clearly don't conform to Allenton's laws. Something going wrong here. Uh, is it the formula's wrong? No, of course not. Theories about physics are never wrong, they're just occasionally incomplete. And that's what's happened here. Uh, Hamilton is absolutely spot on if you're talking about steel locomotive wheels on railway tracks. Uh, then he's got it nailed. But if you're talking about rubber, no. There's a lot, lot of other stuff going on here. And it's because rubber is a very strange material. It's made up of these chemical units called monomers. Um, nowadays we use uh, synthetic rubber polymers and they're all tangled together like a plate of spaghetti. Um, then we have vulcanization. Now this came from an American book so I apologize for the spelling. Vulcanization actually causes crosslinks to occur between the different strands of isomers that are in the, in the rubber and it turns it into this gelatinous mess that we normally uh, understand. Um, it has this uh, uh, feature called hysteresis by which we mean that when we compress it and release it it may not always come back exactly to the extent that it was before we compressed it. It will have a history. The more we compress it, the more often we compress it, the less it will rebound each time. And that's because when we're compressing it, we're altering the way these chains are entangled, the way these uh, isomeric uh, strands are tangled together. We may break some of those vulcanization links, those cross links, and we may cause them to reform in other words. So when we're compressing rubber, we're not compressing a metal spring and getting the same energy back when we let go of it. We're forcing the rubber to undergo deformation internally. That will soak up energy. That energy is essentially the same as the, the frictional loss that we were talking about earlier. It's, it's nature's way of converting motion back into heat. Uh, and it gets the rubber hot. And it uses up uh, the energy that we put into it by compressing it. Think of um, golf ball, drop a golf ball, bounces back up to virtually the same height that I let go. Think of a potty putty ball, drop it, it goes splat. That's the difference in high hysteresis and low hysteresis. It's the amount of energy that's, that's retained by the rubber as a result of that deformation. Now, again, going back to my own history, when um, uh, when I stopped playing with, with, uh, with toy cars and grew up a little bit more, I started playing with electric racing cars and actually building slot racing cars to compete against other kids of the same age. And we imported tyres uh, from the States specifically for their grip value. And some of those tyres uh, had so much hysteresis that if you just squish them a little bit in your fingers, they got so sticky they would literally stick on the wall. So I learned about these sort of things in a very practical way uh, before I started chucking real cars at the scenery. Rubber friction is built up of three separate strands. In the first place, there is an adhesive uh, layer. There is, there is an adhesion between rubber and the surface you put it on. And in, in the case I just told you about, when I stuck it on the wall, it was primarily that adhesion that was holding the, the weight of the rubber. 
it's a chemical business. It's, it's, uh, it may be electrostatic, nobody is quite certain about it. Um, but it only works over very smooth surfaces and only these very short ranges. Then there's uh, potentially a molecular bonding going on. Um, again, only of the areas where there's intimate contact. And there's this definite deformation. Where the rubber is deformed from one surface to the next, we're putting energy into the rubber, we're causing it to deform, uh, that is causing friction because as we then, as the rubber rolls away, that has to spring back. We used up some energy in the process and that causes the uh, resistance. Eventually, if the deformation is too great, we may physically tear pieces of rubber off the surface. And so the uh, physical um, nature of the material, uh, we may do simply physically do work in removing layers of it. Load increases uh, with contact area, as we found out before, very similar way. But notice now that we are having a much greater level of contact between the rubber and the surface. Uh, which means that with rubber we don't get that, we don't get precisely that same independence between contact area and friction coefficient that we had with, let's say, metal surfaces in contact. Rubber is different. That keying uh, is what gives us the grip. And yeah, it makes a point there that the heat being generated within the rubber is retained within the rubber uh, because rubber is a very good insulator. You can also think of this as if you imagine a ship ploughing through the waves. As the bow goes forward through the waves, the water is forced out to one side. That puts a backwards force on the ship. It resists the motion of the ship. As the water's coming around the stern, it feeds in behind the stern and puts a pressure on the back of the ship. Obviously not as great as the resistance on the front, but it is actually applying some force at the back. And so you've got the two things going on here. Uh, as the speed increases, though, with the rubber, because the rubber takes time to reform, it will reduce the amount of fill-in pressure at the back, whereas the resistance at the front is steadily increasing. I may not have explained that as perfectly as I might, but uh, it's just another way in which rubber is, is um, non-linear. Now, even if you have a thin layer of lubricant between these two surfaces, for example, in a, a very slight rain shower, that deformation is still occurring. And again, from my own experience, I can tell you that a very small amount of rain will not, will not significantly affect the amount of grip you've got in a race tyre. Because there's so much of the rubber is being compressed into the track, uh, that the layer of water does not lift the tyre out of that um, deformation range. If it did, then um, that's when you lose the grip. So that's the, um, that's the diagram that was meant to explain the one there uh, with the deformation as the speed increases. Now, there might be other reasons why um, Try to stick on, uh, stick to rubber, but I'm afraid that that's that's a bit beyond me. There's, um, if anybody, I'm sure there are people around here who understand and uh, how the world is perfectly, but um, I don't. So I'm not going to get into that. Uh, there is one way in which I would say rubber science is very much like quantum physics. If you think you understand it, you probably don't. <laughs> but just before we leave this. Uh, subject. Let me just talk about tyre slip. These are motorcycle tyres um, and they, because they illustrate more clearly what's going on here. The tyre is always slipping against the road in some way. At the contact patch, which is a very small area that's actually physically in contact with the road, as the tyre comes down uh, it gets compressed at the front and as it 
comes to the back of the contact patch as the wheel is rolling away, it expands and moves away. There is a slip going on all the way through that, and that's what generates the friction. Now, very little of that in this top picture there, which is equilibrium, but who cares about equilibrium? Race drivers are sometimes doing all three, but well, there is never a situation where you're in equilibrium. The cornering one, which is the next one down, that's where the tyre is being turned to influence the, the car direction. Now, the tyre is turned, the car may not yet be. Imagine that you're going straight on and you simply turn the wheel. On the first instance, the tyre moves, but the car doesn't. The car is still going this way, although the tyre is now pointing that way. What happens is that as the tread comes round the wheel, it is forced to divert sideways, take up a new path running diagonally, and then come back into line with the wheel as it rotates back. Because as you can see, the patch in contact with the road is twisted relative to the, to the car. That's what causes the slip. And without that slip, we wouldn't have any grip. So, accelerating and braking are a bit more obvious. Uh, again, if you're accelerating way hard, then the wheel is accelerating as it goes so that the, uh, the tire uh, contact patch gets uh, stretched out. And in uh, braking, it gets squashed together. So, that's that. I mentioned that the, um, the Allenton formula of uh, friction being independent of contact area doesn't work for, for racing tyres. And that was the realisation that, that came about in the early 60s. And that's why racing tyres just suddenly exploded in, uh, in size and width uh, as we got to understand more and more about it. So that really was the... Um, the defining feature of my uh, growing up with racing cars and uh, until aerodynamics began, began to take over everything else. And it's the point at which I, I lost control of the, uh, of the science. So I just want to close by telling you about the, the, a couple of the sources that I, that I used to put this all together. If you ever want to get into racing, uh, then you need to understand tyre technology, you need to understand grip. And this chap wrote a couple of excellent books and has a good website. And despite being in the middle of a hurricane when I decided to uh, start up an email conversation with him, he was extremely helpful. Genuine all round good guy. I have to say, so is this man. I love it. And by a friend of a friend, I got hold of him. And he had a lot more important things to do than talk to me. Um, but he put me in contact with uh, an awful lot of material. Shell and, and Ferrari have been hand in glove for, for most of the 50 years that I've been involved in this. Um, they don't let out a great deal of public information in, in real detail, but he did point me to some very interesting things, some of which I've used, some of which I haven't. And in particular, he put me in touch with uh, this chap, who's a, a lovely guy, and he was right at the sharp end. Well, just uh, meant, to, meant to say, uh, that's actually Kimi Räikkönen, that's not uh, Gardner. <laughs> <laughs> um, this guy, Mark Wakeham, uh, has, um, knows more about engine lubrication than I will ever know, and I have more, I suspect, than most people will ever know. Uh, wonderful chap. Um, but he also shares with me the distinction of low flying in a Messerschmitt three-wheeler uh, in reverse. Um, he actually uh, got up to third gear. The, the Messerschmitt is a wonderful little car. It has a two-stroke engine. And like a lot of bubble cars at the time, it doesn't have a reverse gear. But Messerschmitt solved it in a very unique manner. You, I kid you not, you literally you turn the engine off and you turn the ignition key in the opposite direction. <laughs> it reverses the polarity to the starter motor and the engine fires up backwards. <laughs> you then have all four gears yeah. Mark, at grunting thought, got into third gear, going backwards, with rear wheel steering on a handlebar system. Yeah. He still carries a bit of glass in his forehead as a memento. 
I was going forward when I turned mine over, and, I'm, and I no longer have the windscreen frame, but that had the, the, the shape of my head in it. Be that as it may. So, as I say, I, I, I put down here, I hope all these gentlemen will forgive me for the way I've uh, simplified what they attempted to teach me um, for any errors that I may have introduced in the process. I'm sure there have been plenty. But I want to finish with this one. Uh, what characterises Formula One for me is what I call a spirit of aggressive optimization. And the best demonstration that I could find for that was, was 2010 when uh, refueling got banned again. Um, prior to that point, cars would be coming into the pits, getting refueled, all new tyres, um, 100 litres of fuel, whatever, and off they went. The first pit stops without refueling took four seconds. Now just imagine 22 of you stood around in the pit lane. The gap that the car is going to get into is millimetres wider than the car itself, and it is going to come steaming down this pit lane at 60 or 80 kph. And it is going to stop there, you hope. Most of the time it does. Then the 22 guys assembled around the car are going to descend on it. They're going, it's stinking hot, it's smelly, it's sticky. Rip the four wheels off, more four, four new tyres on, off it's gone. Four seconds. One, two, three, four, gone. That is remarkable. But it's not the most remarkable thing. The most remarkable thing is that within the year, that four seconds had been reduced to two seconds. They'd halved it. And they'd done that simply by watching and looking at the way the whole thing happened, uh, analysing the process and relentless practising. That's a kind of discipline which means that now technology transfer from Formula 1 isn't a matter of what's happening with cars. It's a matter of what's happening with management and with process development and uh, control. And it's that Formula 1 thinking it is now going into places like Great Ormond Street Hospital and uh, various other places and improving life and death situations in other industries. So, it's what I call the Formula One thinking. And that isn't cheating science, ladies and gentlemen. That is science. Thank you. I've heard a lot of thermodynamics that I hope our second year students will be very familiar with at the end of this semester. Hopefully, yes. Um, <laughs> so, if there are any questions for today, um, well, you're free to ask. Oh, oh come on. Sure. Uh, I'm building a, um, an NI MX5 engine. Okay. I'm putting on throttle bodies. Yep. And I've read a bit about the length of the throttle body while you mm -hmm. were talking at the tune there, and that the size of the throttle, the diameter of the throttle body, body affects the intake speed, yeah. and that a smaller throttle body might be better for low end torque because it speeds the airflow in. It does. I don't understand that. <laughs> <laughs> can you, can you, well, why is a quicker inlet better for low end torque? Simply because it encourages a better cylinder filling, right. you will get uh, a better um, that that volumetric efficiency that we talked about is going to be higher if you've got high gas speed uh, because then all the time the valve is open, you've got mixture coming in. The problem you've got with, a, with a, an ordinary kind of road car engine is the valve opens a bit lazily. You know, the, the, the cam's not too hot, the cam's designed so that you can drive it around and it will still be docile when you pop down the shops. So the valve doesn't open terribly rapidly. So the gas speed in the inlet port doesn't build up particularly rapid, rapidly because it depends on the, on the pressures. You're looking at the, the, uh, the, the vacuum being generated by this piston coming down 
against the air pressure outside is what's dragging the mixture down in the port. If the, if, it's, if the port is smaller, then that vacuum has an easier job of moving the fuel and it therefore increases the, the flow rate. That means that there's more encouragement for the rest of the mixture to come after it and it ends up filling more of the cylinder uh, properly and so you've got more fuel and air in there when the piston comes back up again. That's, that's what's going on and it's just the matter of the compromises that the engine designers have made to keep the car rogue docile. If you have a racing engine in it, you'd have a very much faster rate of opening of the cam uh, and the valve would then open far faster. You'd develop that gas speed more quickly and so more of the engine duration would have the gas moving at high speed. If you think about the engine in terms of its rotation, you've got a there's a position, the engine at uh, top dead centre, and if you look at cam specs, you'll see them marked in degrees. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a, race, there's a point here where it opens, a point where it shuts. You've got that amount of rotational time to fill the cylinder. Yeah. So the faster you can encourage it, the less of that duration, less of that rotation you can use to get the gas going fast, the more gas you'll get in. Right, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So the faster the, the, the valve opens, the more you, you'll fill it. Do you reach a point at high RPM where the wider intake would be less... Yes, if, you, if, if, the, if the intake port's too small, yeah. you'll strangle the mixture then at high revs, yeah. okay. at high power. Yeah. So it's, it's all compromised. Thank you. But I've raced MR2s all my life and I've always been competing in against them next time. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know I shouldn't be helping you. So in terms of fluid tyres, you need to heat them up to get the adhesion definition to give you the grip. But why is it that when you get to a point they get too hot and then you lose all that grip? Sorry, that was, that was I just realised that's something I missed out completely. We've now got to the point uh, first of all, the straight answer to your question is again, it's compromised. The yeah. difference between summer tyres and winter tyres is the heat range that they work on. The difference between road tyres and racing tyres is the heat range that they work on. The rubber is not significantly different, it simply works better at a different design temperature. And so, you want it to be at its optimum temperature under the kind of loads that it's going to get while you're racing. If you overstretch it, because you slide it too much, because you uh, break traction when you're coming out of a slow corner, the tyre gets beyond uh, its normal temperature. And one of the things that happens to rubber when it gets too hot is it goes past a critical temperature and then those sulphur links start breaking down wholesale and the whole thing just turns to jelly. It loses its structural integrity. If you go past that point, it gets to another critical temperature where it becomes brittle uh, and then starts to break up into chunks. And that's why you, you, you go offline on a racing circuit and you're driving over lumps of other rubber. But the point that, that, that I realised I'd forgotten about, uh, I meant to tell you, was really another aspect of cheating. Um, the Formula One uh, engineers now, the Formula One tyre engineers, deliberately make tyres that will not survive for the length of a Grand Prix. So that the drivers are forced into using two or three sets in the race. And to my mind that's cheating because it's cheating us, the public, <laughs> the proper racer. Mm -hmm. Just want to hear that off my chest. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Um, this may be slightly tangential to the physics, but um, you mentioned earlier that various aspects of the engine build and such were all regulated to the degree that there's not a lot of, um, mm. of um, variations that you can do. And I was just wondering why the, pe why the organisers have decided to impose so many restrictions when it restricts the speed of the car. It's this constant battle between the designers and the men in blazers. Um, 
car designers, uh, Formula One racing car designers, will constantly make their cars faster and faster. The circuits are not capable of accepting the cars that we could build. Uh, there is a limit to what they can, you know. The, if you've got a car going 200 miles an hour down a straight, that's, that's more or less containable. But if it's doing 200 miles an hour around the corners and it goes off, the amount of energy involved in that is not containable. You can't keep it out of the crowds. You can't build barriers strong enough. So it's so just you a matter have to of safety. Keep the control. Uh, and also, you want uh, decent racing, which means you have to <coughs> limit the ingenuity that could be applied. The big teams like Mercedes and Ferrari will always have more money and more clever engineers than the other guys. There are getting on for 1,200 people getting those two Mercedes on the grid these days. 1,200 very, <coughs> very <coughs> clever, experienced engineers. Even the truck drivers, and I'll say even the truck drivers, I, I can't, you know, I'm sure there are. You know, the, the, the truck drivers are not just truck drivers, that's the point I want to make. Um, they will spend an hour every day, every week, when they're in the factory, practicing those pit stops. So 40 odd weeks of the year, they're practicing those. They'll do them 12 times, uh, 12 Grand Prix, you know, or three times in a race, but whatever. You know, that's, it, and it's not just the, the drivers who are going to the races and doing the pit stops. It's the drivers who back up the drivers going to the races. And the drivers who back up the drivers who back up the drivers. You know, there will be, for every guy in that picture, there will be another three guys in the factory practicing for an hour every day of every week doing that. That's how Formula One works. Anybody want a job? <laughs> so, I've got another one actually. Yeah. Um, this is um, talk about drag racing now. Yeah. This is a bit of a pub physics debate we've been having going on. <laughs> you might be able to argue with. Um, so they can launch off the line at more than one G, and our yep. sort of rudimentary understanding of the laws of friction is that. You shouldn't be able to do that without something else happening, which I think actually you covered quite a bit of yep. tonight. They run quite a lot of pressures down there in the tyres. Yes. So when the tyres spin up, you get a vertical acceleration as the tyre grows. Ah, okay. Slight. Yes. Slight. I was going to say, how much of the component is that in helping it? No. Not significant. Right. Not significant. Is it more significant <laughs> than any effect you might get from blowing the exhaust out the top of the car to? No. no. My, my, my gut feeling, I'd have to do some numbers, but my gut feeling for that is you know, not significant. Why do they run the tyre pressure so low? Is it to get the contact? Um, be, no, because what they want to do is they want to reduce the stiffness of the sidewalls. Yeah. If you look at, at a uh, drag car when it's taken off, you get some of these slow motion so pictures, cool. you'll see that the hub rotates, the tyre is still stationary, yeah. the car hasn't moved yet, yeah. and it twists up the tyre, and then you get this kind of elastic effect. Um, where, it, where it just starts to launch, and then as soon as it starts to launch, you'll get some slip. The tyre then gets re, uh, returns to its normal shape, and then you've got the sliding friction that's driving the car forward. But the friction is all coming about through the, that mechanism of, uh, of the, the, the rubber deformation against the sliding against the track. Uh, that's where the, the grip is coming from, that's where the thrust is being generated. Um, if you didn't have that wind up in the tyre though, you'd break drive shafts. Right, so it's, a, a it's just a shock absorber. Yeah, yeah. It's oh. a way of decoupling the power from, because as soon as you dump the clutch, you can't, there is no way with the kind of power that the drag race has got that you can modulate the clutch to feed it in. You've got to have some kind of semi automatic mechanism to do that. And the tyre is what does it. And this is why you don't need big tyres on jet cars, isn't it? Because the thrust isn't going through the tyres, it's coming from... It's coming from the reaction, yeah, that's right. Yeah, all the, all the tyres on the, uh, all the thrust have got to do is stop it running on the ground. And keeping it in a straight line, which is also difficult. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? So, if not, I would like 
Thank you, David, uh, for this very nice talk, for having this, uh, hosting this lecture today. And on behalf of the IOP, the Institute of Physics, and the University of Oberhampton, please accept this. Oh, thank you very much. Great. Thank you. And let's thank David again with a round of applause.